Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Dark Reading News Desk, coming to you live from Black Hat 2023. I'm Becky Bracken. I'm an editor with Dark Reading, and I am here to welcome Adam Myers, who just got a new title, so you'll excuse me. He is head of counter-adversary operations for CrowdStrike. Thanks for joining us, Adam. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. We've got a lot to get into. So. Uh, I know you guys had a new report that came out, but maybe we can do this more geographically. Last year, um, everybody was very focused on APT groups in Russia, mm. what they were doing in Ukraine, and sort of what, how the cybersecurity community could rally around the citizens there and, and, and help them. There seems to have been a, a pretty sizable shift in the, in the ground since then. Can you give us an update sort of of what's happening in Russia um, now versus maybe a year ago? So I think uh, where, you know, leading up to the invasion in February of 2022, there was a lot of concern about a not petia style event where there would potentially be cyber spillover, uh, an unconstrained self-propagating ransomware type of disruptive attack. And so, you know, leading into that whole uh, invasion, I think people were really concerned about how that would impact organizations in the West. Because remember, not petia did like $10 billion in damages according to, I think it was the White House said that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, well-founded concern going into that. And I think what we saw as that started to unfold, that there was some disruptive attacks, but it was generally constrained with inside of Ukraine. Um, after the conflict kind of started really not going in the right direction for the Russians, you started to see that they went back to more intel collection. And there was plenty of disruptive wiper type attacks, but I think the thing that was most significant is that while everybody was focused on what was going on inside of Ukraine and what the Russian, various Russian threat actor groups were doing, China was prolifically getting into every single geographic region, every business vertical, and actively collecting on everything from intellectual property, uh, trade negotiations, high-speed high rail projects, port projects, like pretty much everything going on and build a massive collection effort around that. Were they using the Russian invasion as cover while everybody was sort of looking over here? Were they doing that or was this happening sort of well before that? That's a good question. I think it, it worked out that it, it provided that kind of cover because everybody was so focused on what was happening in Russia and Ukraine. And so it distracted from the kind of steady drumbeat of everybody calling out China for doing the things that they were doing. So we know Russia's motivations. What um, are Chinese APT groups, what are their motivations? What are they trying to do? So it's a massive collection platform. And they are working to, you know, China has a number of different major programs. They have things like the 14th Five-Year Plan. They have the Made in China 2025 Initiative. They have the Belt and Road Initiative. And so they've built all of these different programs in order to grow the economy, to develop the economy in China. Some of the major things that they've targeted are around things like healthcare. It's the first time that the Chinese uh, are dealing with an increasing middle class. And so preventative healthcare issues, heart stents, diabetes, cancer treatments, all of that. And they recognize that they're sourcing a lot of that from the West. They don't want to do that. They want to build it there. They want to have domestic equivalent products so they could service their own market and then grow that into the surrounding area, the, the broader Asia Pacific region, and then even up into Eurasia. And through doing that, they build additional influence. They, they build these ties to these countries where they can start to push Chinese products and Chinese solutions and Chinese programs and projects into those countries so that when push comes to sh shove on an issue like Taiwan or something that they don't like at the United Nations, they could say, hey, you should really vote this way. We would appreciate it. So it's really an intelligence collection and, and uh, intellectual property game for them? 100%. And so what, what are we sort of going to see in the next few years? Are they going to operationalize this intelligence? Is it already I know, you know, feeding sort of the intellectual class? But beyond that, what are their goals? It's happening right now, right? Um, you look at what they've been doing with AI. Uh, you look at what they've been doing with uh, healthcare and various uh, chip manufacturing, right? They, they source most of their chips externally. They don't want to do that, right? right. They, 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 I think they think that people see them as the world's workshop and they really want to become an innovator. And the way that they're looking to do that is by leapfrogging. They steal 
through cyber operations, cyber espionage, what is currently state of the art, and then they try to replicate and innovate on top of that. Interesting. Well, okay. So um, moving from China, now we go over to North Korea, and they are in the business. Their APT groups are money makers, right? That's what they're looking to do. Partially, yeah. So there's kind of three pieces of it. Um, one, they certainly serve as the diplomatic, military, and political intelligence collection process. Uh, two, they also do intellectual property theft. Uh, they launched a program called the National Economic Development Strat Strategy, or NEDS. Mm -hmm. And um, with that, there's kind of six core areas that they focus on, things like energy and mining, agriculture, uh, heavy machinery, all, the th uh, all things that are associated with the North Korean economy. They need to raise the cost, or like the level of, of what they're doing, and, and raise the lifestyle of the average North Korean citizen, 33% or something like that of the country doesn't need, is, is all the 30% only has access to reliable power. Wow. Right? So things like renewable energy and ways to kind of get energy to other places are important. So they do intellectual property theft to kind of do that as well. And then revenue generation. They got cut off from the international uh, SWIFT, system. SWIFT system and international financial economies. And so now they have to find ways to generate revenue. They have something called the third floor, the third office, which generates revenue for the regime and also for the, the Kim family. And so they do a lot of things, things that are like uh, drugs, uh, fentanyl creation and, and uh, MDMA and things like that. They do uh, human trafficking and they also do cybercrime. And so they've been very effective at targeting traditional financials as well as cryptocurrency and kind of fintech type companies. And we've seen that uh, one of the things in our report that just came out yesterday shows that the second most targeted vertical last year was financials, which replaced telecoms the year before. So it's it's making an impact. And is that being, that's being driven by the North Korean APT In part, first. yeah. Interesting. Are they successful? Yeah. They're making tons of money? Yeah, billions. Okay. Let's pivot to uh, Iran. Okay. which I guess is sort of the other major pillar of APT action. What's going on there? So we've seen a lot of what we call um, lock and leak operations. They kind of created, in many cases, these fake personas to mm. target their enemies, to go after Israel and the United States and, and kind of Western countries. And they create these fake personas that will claim to have hacked in. Uh, they deploy ransomware. It's not really ransomware because they don't care about collecting the money necessarily. They just want to cause that disruption and then they leak sensitive information. All of this meant to delegitimize and to you know, make people kind of lose faith or, or, or uh, belief in uh, the political organizations or the companies that they're targeting. So it's really a disruptive campaign masquerading as e-crime. It must be so tricky to try to assign um, motivation behind, behind a lot of these attacks. How do you do that? I mean, how do you know that it's just a front for disruption and not you know, a money-making operation? Yeah, that's a great question, but it, it's actually not that difficult because if you look at what actually happens, right, what transpires, if they're criminal and they're financially motivated, they're going to take payment. That's their primary objective, right? If they don't really seem to care about making the money, not Petia being an example, uh, and also you know some of the Iranian activity, then you know it's it's pretty obvious to us. We look at the targeting, we look at the infrastructure and the tooling that they use, and then we look at the the motive itself, and it, it's generally pretty clear. Among APT groups, what are some of the like attacks du jour? What are they really relying on right now? So we've seen a lot of APT groups going after. Uh, network type appliances. Um, there's been a lot of vulnerabilities that have been exposed in uh, various cloud systems and, and network appliances, things that don't typically have modern endpoint security stacks on them. And it's not just APT groups. We see this tremendously with ransomware groups, which have been thwarted by things like EDR technology, which have made it difficult for them to get in and, and bring tooling with them. So 80% of the attacks are using legitimate credentials to get in. They live off the land, they move laterally from there, and then if they can, in many cases, they're going after the hypervisors in order to try to deploy ransomware to a hypervisor that doesn't support an EDR tool, and then they can lock all of the servers that are running on that hypervisor and put the organization out of business. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. I would really like to discuss this for a much longer amount of time, but can you um, just quickly, what is your prediction? Do you have a 
do you have a Karnak the Great moment for us where we can, what are we going to be looking at in the APT space, do you think, 12 months from now? Yeah, the APT space has been pretty consistent. I think we'll see them continue to evolve. The vulnerability landscape is really interesting there. If you look at China, for example, effectively any vulnerability research has to go through the CNIT SEC, which is subordinate to the Ministry of State Security. It would be like if a security researcher here couldn't send that vulnerability to Microsoft. It had to go to the government. 1,200 vulnerabilities last year, right? Uh, and so if they had to send it to CISA, but CISA was subordinate to the, you know, the CIA or the NSA. Right. So it, and we see those vulnerabilities manifesting all the time now. So it's, it's changed that whole landscape. So I think APT groups continue to do that. They're focused on intelligence collection. They're, 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 that's their primary motive. In some cases, there's disruption as well. Um, and then, you know, the, I think the prediction, uh, the thing that everybody needs to be thinking about is that because of the identity threats that we're seeing, 80% of these breaches involve identity. It takes, uh, we, we compute something called the breakout time. How long does it take for an actor to move from an initial foothold into the environment to another system? We uh, shaved off, or they shaved off another five minutes this year, so we're at 79 minutes. The fastest one we saw was seven minutes. So these actors are moving faster. Mm -hmm. And the biggest takeaway, I think, is that organizations really need to be investing in identity protection because that is kind of, you know, we've hardened the enterprise. We've made it difficult for them to operate because of things like EDR. So they took the easier way, right? Now they're using legitimate credentials. They're coming in as a legitimate user. And in order to defend against that, you need to be protecting the identity, yeah, not just the enterprise. Thank you so much, Adam. I so appreciate you stopping by the news desk to share your insights and your smarts with us. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. It's always fun. Uh,